You know, uh, the best way to make good grass is to burn down the old. Friend Hoot Gibson was burning his pasture one time. Somebody in town got nervous about the fire and they called the fire department. These fellows came out with some big red trucks and started through his gate. And he said, hold on there, where are you guys going? What do you want to do? He said, we're going to put this fire out. He said, no, this is my fire and it's doing okay. You fellows need to put one out. You start one of your own. Firefighters in Yellowstone National Park are keeping a careful watch on eight small lightning-caused blazes, but at this time, no suppression action is being taken. Right now, southwesterly winds are gusting from 20 to 40 miles per hour. We're in the bad country near Clover Creek, Lamar Valley. Smoke's heavy, but I think the fire's crossing the river. All fires, except for Narrows, should burn. Air tanker is coming in. Base, base. We've got a very explosive type of situation in Cafe Meadow. Do you want me to pull them out? Over. Hand crews, we need more hand crews down here. Base, trees here are torching out. We have an air tanker, and we have an air tanker. Air tanker on its way. We're pulling crews out of Cafe Meadow. Do you copy? We're pulling crews out of Cafe Meadow. Do you copy? in crisis. It's the summer of 1988 and, as always, three million tourists will pass through the serenity that is Yellowstone, America's first national park. A burst of thunder, a streak of lightning, and then a flame ignites some brush, nature's flashpoint. The historic Yellowstone fires of 1988 burned almost a million and a half acres. Nearly half the park was on fire. 25,000 firefighters fought countless blazes for more than three months. The total cost to fight the fires, $125 million. Trees burst into flames like toothpicks in a torch. Crown fires advanced from five to 10 miles per day, speeds unheard of when it comes to forest fuels. The damage was so severe that natural fire programs were shut down all across the country some permanently. We now know it was an overreaction, but this slice of fire history 
proved to be a turning point in the discussion regarding the positive effects of fire, as well as reintroducing fire back into the landscape. The Yellowstone fires were a major event, not only for the American public, for the global public, forcing them to consider the ways in which fire might be natural, in which fire, even very large, intense fires, might have a place. And for that, it was all to the good. But the question was not whether fire belonged in Yellowstone or not. The question was what kind of fire, at what cost, by what means. I think the big misconception the public has is that we can manage fire, that it isn't terribly dangerous, that uh, we can control fire, and uh, uh, that we have enough resources to, uh, to take care of fire. And that's just not the case. Fire can be a terribly formidable force that we can't manage so well. We looked at the site. Is Yellowstone devastated by these fires? Well, no. I think a case could be made that we burned up in one year what would have been burned up over a century since the park had been protected. But nonetheless, it was not an intrinsically damaging thing. I think that argument forces us to ask, what happened to all those missing fires over the last century? Were they fires that nature set and we suppressed? Or were there fires that people had traditionally set we no longer do? So it forces us to reevaluate the way people are in the system. And I think it forces us to rethink what we mean by fire ecology. By removing fire from the landscape, a catastrophic fire like Yellowstone is simply unavoidable. By allowing fuel loading or excess biomass to reach dangerous levels, by failing to remove dead or dying trees, and then finally, by suppressing periodic low intensity fires, we create forests that resemble powder kegs. I had been part of the, the fire program for 10 years prior to 88, and so um, I was fortunate to go out there on site with different crews, and we would set up our monitoring plots and, and uh, our weather stations, you know, and call them weather, and I'd leave and I'd go to, to different fires. The fires began because of an inordinately dry summer. The spring had been very wet, we had a lot of fine fuels growing, and then we never got the traditional June rains. But then as the fire season continued to progress, um, we needed information on how big these fires were and started to make fire behavior projections about what the fires were going to do. And, and so I had the opportunity to, to fly around. The park had been experiencing over the previous several hundred years a massive buildup of fuel in the lodgepole pine forest. At first, everyone felt it was a blessing because we needed to reduce the fuel load that was here. It was, it was just common knowledge that we had a horrendously unsafe situation. It's not dissimilar to the situation we face now nationwide. I feel very fortunate to have experienced 1988. I mean, on one hand, it was very exciting, and there was a lot going on. You know, it was a busy year. I wasn't in position to where, like a lot of other um, high-ranking officials, you know, there was a lot of public scrutiny and that kind of thing. And, and I, was pr I was removed from that, so uh, um, I got to you know, be a fire ecologist and a fire behavior analyst throughout the whole summer and really experience things that, you know, I made, I, I'll probably never experience again in my lifetime. I think we need only look back to the 88 fires in Yellowstone and to see what's happened on the landscape since. We have this great profusion of young forest returning. We have a, a landscape that is really going to be a gift to future generations who will be able to see this abundance return to the park in ways that 100 years of fire suppression had, had turned portions of that park into a lodgepole desert. And now we're going to see a forest that benefits a whole variety of species. In addition to a forest that will continue to serve as the headwaters of clean water for municipalities far downstream. Because Yellowstone's effects were not limited to Yellowstone or to the smoke or to offstream floods or the rest of it. They influenced how people thought about fire what kinds of fires they were willing to tolerate on the landscape. So it forced us to reevaluate our policies. Many parks and reserves that had natural fire programs shut them down. Other countries like Russia and Australia didn't want anything to do with this. So it affected how fire appeared on the earth, all over the US and all over the world. That is fire ecology. But it's being cycled through people, through our ideas, our images, our perceptions or misperceptions of fire. Yellowstone 1988 was a high-profile example of a much larger ecological problem. Many began to question the message of Smokey Bear, 
And did we as a nation overemphasize the idea of fire suppression? Today, Ed will become a killer. And here's his weapon. Good old Ed Morgan. A mighty careful man in his own home. He can't imagine how anyone could have been so careless. Ed Morgan, every man, anyone who handles fire in any form is a potential killer. Anyone can start a fire and never even know it. Please be very careful with fire, please. Only you can prevent forest fires. Today there is this, this political push, if you will, to micromanage the way that we deal with fire when in fact fire is this all-pervasive force Everything about the West, the beauty, the fertility of the valleys, the abundance of the wildlife, it all comes back to the fact that fire has been a key agent on our public lands. I think from the very beginning of our country that uh, we sort of misunderstood the role of fire in nature. and We've seen fire tear through great cities like New York and Boston and Chicago, and we've always thought that fire is bad, uncontrolled fire is bad, and we look to the forest the same way, and I think the human reaction is to extinguish the fire, to put it out, to get rid of it. But fire doesn't behave like floods or like lava flows. It's a process. It's not necessarily a thing or an item that moves around on the earth. We've lost our human affinity for fire. We've forgotten how important fire is. I think a lot of the, the misconceptions with fire come because it's no longer a part of our everyday experience. We live in cities. There are good reasons to fear open flames in cities. There are good reasons to get rid of it, to build fireproof structures and so forth. But if your only experience of fire is seeing it in those kinds of damaging, catastrophic ways, then the tendency will be to project that personal or social experience out onto the landscape in general. That nature's economy has to run just like ours, and they don't. It's different. Everywhere that humans went, we brought European notions of fire suppression with us. And steadily, over 150 years, we snuffed out fire and, and we refused to allow it to be the agent that it had been for countless millennia. I think that the catastrophic fires that we've had in the sense, at least from a public perception of catastrophic, a lot of acres burning, a lot of footage through the mass media giving this impression that fire was essentially destroying and consuming the West. And because we've practiced fire suppression for well over 100 years, we've created conditions which make those fire events seem that much worse. Well, the cost of fire suppression, or more broadly, our attempt at fire exclusion has been enormous. And it's taken lots of forms. It's been economic, it's been ecological, it can even be measured in terms of loss of human life and property. Author Richard Manning, writing in the New York Times, says, the forests of the Northern Rockies have been severely damaged because of a century of firefighting. The greatest threat to our forests has been our own efficiency. The West ought to burn, and we ought to have the political will to burn it. If we don't, the trees will die, the fuels will accumulate, the drought will come, and the west will burn anyway, only hotter. Well, on the surface, one effort is trying to extinguish the fire. The other effort is trying to start the fires. I think the question is, what's the most appropriate method for that particular piece of land at that particular time? It may be to let a fire burn without extinguishing it. It may be to extinguish it if it's threatening structures and and other resources like the watershed or particularly with the air quality. Or it may be if there's not a fire and hasn't been for a while, maybe it's time there was a fire. That's the part where we use prescribed fire to insulate certain resources, for example, structures and communities by burning the forest, burning all the fuels out. So there's less of a chance that a devastating fire could start and, and spread and do further damage. Well, fire shakes and bakes. Uh, fire is part of the creative destruction in nature's economy. It breaks open stuff, nutrients and chemicals that are locked up in dead wood or, or peat can be liberated by fire. Fire, it's uh, smoke can uh, stimulate uh, flowering and production. Uh, it rearranges the structure of an ecosystem. It selects against some organisms, selects in favor of others. We've looked at reintroducing fire back into some of those ecosystems, and that has been a very effective tool. It's a costly, it's a risky business, 
that uh, you have to kind of weigh all of the, the facts and the figures and uh, the potential of what that fire will ultimately do. But generally, it's good. We do have good prescribed fire programs in every state in the United States. It's been effective, and fire has a real place in land management. For the most part, controlled or prescribed burning has been utilized on a small scale, using natural barriers such as rivers, lakes, rock formations, and open fields as added guarantees that the blaze will remain controlled. So there are conflicts. A lot of people are very opposed to using fire because they're afraid of fire. But in the big picture, fire can be used in a lot of places, and it can be effective. Fire suppression has been effective in a lot of places, and the blending of the two is just the way that it has to be in the future. Wildfire on the planet is older than human history itself. We didn't invent fire. It was already out there for more than 400 million years. Fire will outlive us. It will outlive our buildings, our words. It will even outlive styrofoam. In fact, when the planet bids farewell, it will probably do so in a blaze of solar fire. Earth is a fire planet, I mean, from day one, and fire will always be a part of every ecosystem at some point in time. And what we've done is we've entered those ecosystems and we have taken fire out of a lot of them. When fire does get into those ecosystems, it's not natural, it's extremely intense, it's extremely costly to deal with. Fire is pretty well fundamental to life on the planet. You know, the chemistry of combustion is very elemental. All it does is take apart what photosynthesis puts together. When that happens in a cell, we call it respiration. When it happens out in the open, we call it fire. Fire is not an alien visitation on the planet. It's something which has been around for a very long time. Fire has been the life-giving force. It was perhaps the seminal agent in humankind in being able to move out and disperse across the landscape. This is who we are. We, we are the fire creature. This is our ecological niche. Other animals knock over trees, dig holes in the ground, and eat grass and hunt and do all of this stuff but we're the creature that manipulates fire. The question is, are we doing it in sane ways? Are we doing it in ways that advance our interests and advance the other interests on whose behalf we manage fire? Since the Yellowstone fires of 1988, we've, we've been obsessed in particular with the problem of houses and wildlands intermixing. And this problem has really dominated national attention. During a fire, fire management effort, a lot of resources are directed to um, protecting structures as opposed to uh, attacking or directing energies towards trying to control the fire. And as a result, the, the fire management effort becomes defensive rather than offensive. And it means the fire just tends to tends to grow bigger and bigger. We just have to acknowledge that people want to build in these natural areas. It's a fact. It's happening everywhere. We can't ignore it. The people that have lived here for a long time or have you know, come generation after generation, they're aware of the wildfire problem. But what happens is the newer people might move from an urban area like New York City or Philadelphia. They might move into this area. And they definitely don't realize that wildfires occur and that they potentially can threaten them. So what we need to do is just say, you cannot take the, the urban lifestyle and translate it into a natural woody area, it just doesn't work. You've got to make some adjustments in planning and in lifestyle and daily activities. The wildland urban interface, what is it? It's the actual physical coming together of the population with the land where wildfire is a natural and ongoing occurrence. It's this complex relationship that, more often than not, results in the loss of property and human life. And when wildfire burns to catastrophic proportions, it can systematically alter ecosystems, creating very real threats, like affecting the drinking water for large metropolitan areas. The Wildland Urban Interface specifically was identified in, in 1965 when a a UC Berkeley professor coined the term wildland urban interface. At that point in time, fire agencies in California recognized the problem and, and we've been directing programs at that, uh, that issue ever since then. The wildland urban interface is a very perplexing problem. People love the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It provides them with good jobs and beautiful scenery 
great places to raise their kids. Who would not want to move here? However, a lot of the people that are moving into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and in other parts of the West, where they're moving into these wildland areas, don't particularly think about the fact they may be moving into a vegetation type that is fire prone. Now we have more houses. It's almost as though we're revisiting the whole settlement process over again. It's like the end of the 19th century with a, an exurban migration. Again, we've learned that the problem was not simply suppressing fires. You always need to control fires you don't want, bad fires. The problem was that we quit lighting fires. We took fire out of the landscape in ways that proved to be self-destructive. The cost of putting it back together again is going to be immense. It's like we would need a whole super fund. Huge amounts of the public lands are now filled with the combustion equivalent of toxic waste. And how we're going to clean that up on a large scale and a useful scale, no one has a clear idea. Well, fire is one of those natural events that we have certain controls over, just as Michael Crichton said in one of his books, scientists do things because they can and don't ask if they should. And I think we tend to look at fire as, well, we can extinguish this. The question is, should we extinguish it? It means we start using our heads and deciding what kinds of fires are appropriate where there's presently an enormous maldistribution of fire. Too much of the wrong kind, not enough of the right kind. That responsibility is ours. There's some fire that we, we have to understand that there's not enough resources, there's not enough money, there's not enough equipment, there's not enough firefighters to even begin to make a dent in what the fire is going to do. We have to learn to, to build, we have to learn to live, we have to learn to modify our lifestyles to fit the earth. We can't always modify the earth to fit our lifestyles. This is one of the most fundamental things we do as a species. This is part of our identity. We are the, the keeper of the flame and we've reduced it to simply trying to put it out. There must be some way out of here Say the joker to the theme There's too much confusion I can't get no relief Businessmen, they drink my wine Plowmen dig my I went to an area called the Great Burn, a stretch of wilderness swept by the 1910 fires of Idaho and Montana. To this day, it remains a country of open ridges, meadows, still fire resistant 84 years later. You know, there's a way to fight fire, and it's with fire. Richard Manning, writing in the New York Times. Resilient may be the word that best defines nature, an astonishing system able to withstand almost any strain without permanent injury. Organisms have to accommodate fire. It's simply out there. They have to make sense of it. And, and in general, they do it in two ways. One is by protecting themselves from fire. They have thick bark or thick tissues that protect the flowering parts, or they can flee or go into burrows. They have some way to avoid the negative effects of fire. But there's also a sort of promotive quality to adaptations. That is, many organisms can thrive in the ash. Their competitors are driven off, perhaps. Some will begin to flower. In some cases, some conifers have sealed cones with waxes, and, and very strong heating, such as fire, can release that seal, release the seeds. The plant communities who are most directly affected by fire are very resilient and have mechanisms with which to deal with fire, and that could be the way they put out seed or the way the seeds are stored in the seed bank or the use of rhizomes and roots and tubers that are left in the ground, you know, to re-sprout following a fire. Nature, in a way, is not very beautiful in the sense of it's not a postcard out there, and a lot of the species that we care about can't live in those postcard kind of situations. They need it roughed up around the edges to a certain extent. And if we manage all land for one condition, we're going to manage only for one set of plants and animals. Things have occurred that we didn't expect. Things like changing ecosystems from very open forests to uh, now forests that are very dense with trees and not very diverse and that are extremely prone to fire. The historic and conventional view that wildfires were bad for forests began to change in earnest during the 1940s with the work of ecologist John Curtis at the University of Wisconsin. Increasingly, studies found that 
controlled burns could help regenerate the elements of an ecosystem. In the Lodge Pulpine ecosystems of the park here, fire returns to the area on a very long interval, two to 400 years, but when it does, it is very intense and it results in the complete elimination or, or burns, completely burns the whole stand and causes stand reinitiation to occur all over again. On the other hand, researchers in the Ponderosa Pine ecosystem, for example, lower elevation, fires tend to come much more frequently, 20 to, to 40 years or so. And when the fires do occur, they, they tend to be of a much lower intensity. They'll burn on the forest floor and not consume the crowns. But it results in, in this frequent low intensity that tends to clean out the understory and prevent the accumulation of, of a lot of heavier, larger fuels. Fire does not nuke an area and sterilize it. There are very small instances in particular cases where that may happen. But for the most part, fire happens because of things around it. Fire synthesizes its surroundings, so it can't, in a sense, transcend those surroundings. It is a part of this whole exchange that's going on. One of the misunderstandings that people have about wildfires are that they're bad or they're good, that we put these emotional connotations to wildfire. Wildfire just is. All these negative connotations that go into what the media says, and from a human point of view, that is true. But what's interesting is the media, which you know, their goal is to be objective, puts these negative connotations onto wildfires as they report. Devastating and catastrophic are those words that you would use to define fires? Well, I, I, no. I, these words like catastrophic and devastation, I mean, they are they're emotional words, you know, that we use to, 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 to describe what we perceive as the effects of the fire. Fire is part of the natural conditions of our world. It is important that we understand that role. It is important that we make every effort that we can through that understanding to utilize fire in the way that our Mother Earth utilizes fire to help cleanse the land, to eliminate the catastrophic wildfire conditions that we have across many thousands of acres here in this country. Wildfire is a tool that we're going to have to learn how to use and use well. The study of anything depends on a study of history, and our relationship with fire is no exception. A relationship that has been intricate and at times intimate, but like all relationships, always interdependent. We as a species have had a monopoly over fire for all of our existence. We've always manipulated it. No other creature has had that capacity. I'm sure we'll never allow any other creature to possess it. It would destroy our world uh, very quickly. We had power over fire first because we could manipulate it, pick it up, move it around, then because we could start it. But being able to start it still means you're at nature's mercy. It's only if nature presents fuel. The next stage is that we begin creating fuel. We begin growing it, slashing it letting creatures churn it up. And that still has limits. More recently, we've industrialized. We've gone for our fuel into the geologic past, essentially unbounded amounts of fossil biomass. And that's what we're burning now. The interaction of all those different kinds of fire practices gives us a very complicated mosaic. And how they interact, compete, and complement each other is something we don't really understand, but have to sort out before we're going to get control over it. With fire in tow, man colonized the planet. Anthropogenic fire, that is, man's fire, spread steadily across the landscape. The flame passed from generation to generation. Ultimately, man's early quest for fire was a quest for power. In fact, 12,000 years ago, Paleo-Indians moved onto the North American continent across the Bering Bridge. And with fire as a powerful tool, they aggressively forged a new continent, shaping a very diverse ecosystem. A myth lingers that Native Americans were environmentally benign, but in actuality, Native Americans displayed a keen sense of fire knowledge. Native Americans, like, like virtually all people, have used fire to make their world more habitable. And the interesting question is how? In growing up on the reservation and visiting and learning from the tribal elders that were there, they taught me that there's importance in all things of Mother Nature. 
Native American use of fire in all parts of the country in the past was very effective from the standpoint of clearing land for improving vegetation, bringing in wildlife, improving herds of buffalo. I mean, the list goes on and on. Researchers and historians tell us that um, Native Americans use fire for a number of different purposes. It may be to burn a range and improve forage for the horses or to attract uh, wildlife to, to game ranges, you know, where, where, uh, where concentrated wildlife could be harvested to, to feed the tribe. There's such a great respect in the Native American world of all things of Mother Nature that in learning about them, in singing about them, in gaining that respect, that we gain the understanding that we need in order to work with Mother Earth and help her stay healthy. Many of the regimes, the plant regimes, ponderosa pine is fire dependent. The current policies of suppression and the aggressive nature of our suppression uh, activities over the recent years, we've actually, in my opinion, have damaged the normal ecosystem. There's a lot of species that evolved that require fire. And once we've eliminated fire from the system, we basically have made it so those species can't persist. So loss of fire from Native American burning as well as control of fires through lightning strike ignitions has pushed a number of species to the edge of nearly disappearing. I'll never forget a dear friend, a medicine man actually, uh, Kurt Lota, um, walking around my place and looking around and very naturally without judgment uh, saying, yeah, this needs to burn, it's ready, it's ripe, you know with no sort of, oh my God, we got to do something, just it was part of the natural process. As they believe, there really is no good or bad in nature, there's just what's true, what's real. The prototypical European countryside image was one where everything had its assigned spot. Fire belonged in the hearth or with the blacksmith. Open and free flame existed far beyond fenced-in borders. Theoretically, fire didn't belong at all. The geography of fire that we have today is a result of Europe's expansion and its understanding of fire or its misunderstanding of fire. And fire was always distrusted by intellectuals, by officials, by people living in cities. But it was absolutely fundamental to people who actually lived on the land. And so there's a huge quarrel within Europe between those who would like to abolish it as dangerous, who see it as a sign of social unrest and destruction, and those who actually need it. And that quarrel is then projected as Europe expands out to other lands and instead of dealing with their own peasants they're dealing with all kinds of indigenous peoples for whom fire may be even more extravagant than it ever was in Europe and so the collision is enormous. Imagine the British in India or southern Africa for example some of the most pyrophobic intellectuals on the planet dealing with some of the most pyrophilic peoples and the collision is huge. Much of European expansion is a kind of sustained firefight Who's going to control the land? That will be fought very largely over who controls fire. Fire suppression, fire abolition becomes a way of controlling those native landscapes and the peoples. The other part that's important is the more mythological component, and that says that fire is power. And it's very clear, not only in European, but in mythologies around the world, that human beings are not of much significance before they acquire fire. We don't, we don't have strength, we don't have smell, we don't have talons, we're not fast. We're sort of among the real weak links in the great chain of being. But then when we get fire, we become powerful. And suddenly the whole order of things begins reversing. But the sense is, is very real and powerful that fire is a source of human power, human identity, and hence is in some ways sacred, must be sacred. People gather around the fire. That's what defines the group the tribe, the family. Much of the history of the problem that we have today stems from the early settlement of the nation. So we brought in livestock in too big a numbers, we harvested timber in uh, too large a quantities, we mined areas that we shouldn't have been mining, we've dammed rivers that uh, we shouldn't have dammed. We were highly focused on development and getting the country settled. Ironically, it was the birth of Yellowstone that changed the model. The establishment of the first national park in 1872 meant that the United States government needed to manage public land and create public policy on the welfare of that land. But a conflict arose. Nature dictates that forest burn, and this burning of the forest was seen as a threat. 
We have extensive wildland fires in the United States because we have extensive wildlands. So the act of interfering with the settlement process, setting aside large areas to be maintained in a quasi-wildland state, created the necessity for a new set of fire practices and ultimately a new policy. It actually begins with Yellowstone National Park, the federal involvement. In 1886, the cavalry took over the park very largely to fight fires, and that became the model. So by reserving these lands, you create a unique habitat for fire. We had no precedent for this because people had always been a part of it. Now you've excluded people from living off the land. What kinds of fire practices are appropriate? Basically, what it meant was that you either convert those lands to something less combustible, or you do the burning yourself. Early 1900s, the policy of to extinguish the fire by 10 a.m., the day after it was reported, that very aggressive suppression policy just further built up the, the fuels. And at the same time, we've had a population that's moved into these areas and started to populate these areas where fire occurred naturally. The key institution here is the U.S. Forest Service, uh, which looked initially to Europe for models, thought that fire exclusion would be appropriate, believed it was possible, found out over a long term it was not. 1910 is often referred to as the year of the fires. Called a holocaust by many, the great fires of 1910 burned through nearly five million acres of land. 79 firefighters died. These wildfires had their own scorched earth policy. Fallout literally darkened the skies over New England and dropped black soot on the ice of Greenland. The Forest Service was only five years old as it faced its first and so far greatest test as the American West roared out of control. In fact, the great fires of 1910 helped to define the way fires were fought throughout the 20th century, from land management to the actual tools used by firefighters. The fires of 1910 were a seminal moment in American fire history. They targeted particularly what we might call the frontier fire scene. All these settlers and, and still Native Americans setting fires, using it in traditional ways, trying to control that. By the 1930s, they've done what they can in the accessible areas. The question is, how far can you push it to the backcountry? And with the Great Depression, the political possibilities of that, a tremendous liberation of federal investment, they begin to push it everywhere. That the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. World War II, the onset of the Cold War, gives rise to another sort of concern, particularly dealing with very large, catastrophic fires. The belief that the next war will involve rural America, this would be a fire war. Heavy sort of fire ordinance has been created, culminating in the atomic bomb. Fire imagery dominates the scene, and this continues. So an all-out sort of program, a kind of Cold War on fire. But gradually, this begins faltering. And by 1970, the recognition that fire has an ecological role, the costs and self-destructive qualities of fire suppression give rise to an interest in fire in the wilderness, somehow restoring natural fire. And this culminates, I think, in the Yellowstone fires of 88 and the complexity of that. And since then, we've really been in another particular fire problem, which has to do with houses and wildlands intermixing. We begin to realize fire has ecological and uh, economic costs. Uh, fatalities are a part of the story. Is this what our relationship to fire should be? Is fire is a fire fight? Is this how we're going to sum all of our complex human connections with fire? And so there's an attempt to redefine the story, to reintroduce fire in some form. I think we need to shift the paradigm and begin to look at the wild land, private land interface. For example, in the same way we're beginning to look at floodplains. In the past, we allowed people to build next to areas prone to catastrophic flooding. And I think we've learned that that's a very dangerous thing to do and ultimately a very expensive thing to do. A couple of places that we've, we've worked uh, real well to, to help reintroduce fire has been in Florida, where fire historically occurred really extensively, maintain these open pine systems. By reapplying fire in there, we've helped 
reduce one fire loads, but also restore the ecology, especially for a lot of rare and threatened endangered species. Yes, we have wildfires. We put them out. We try to keep them small, especially uh, areas like New Jersey, where even a small fire could quickly threaten people's lives or their property. So we have to suppress wildfires. But then we also have the uh, situation where if we do suppress the fires, uh, we do have the fuel buildup. So we need to use the uh, prescribed fire to reduce that fuel buildup. Anytime you deviate from nature, anytime you deviate from the balance that's taken millennia to develop, somewhere, somehow, sometime you pay a price. When man seized control of fire, there was an intrinsic bargain at work in that exchange. We took the flame, but it lacked an instruction manual on how to use it properly. We took the power. Can we accept and assume the responsibility? <laughs> I definitely thought coming out here that fire was a, was a bad thing. I came completely close-minded to the fact that fire was something that needs to happen, in, especially in the Western ecosystem, that fire was here before this land was settled and fire is going to be here after everyone is dead and gone. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. Growing up in Cincinnati, I really didn't have much wildfire until recently. There was a big fire down in Red River Gorge, which is pretty close to my home. And I would never have guessed that fire could have came that close, and now that it has, it's become more aware to me, and I think a lot of homeowners don't realize that wildfire, even though you do live in an area that doesn't have it very often, maybe once every 100 years, it can happen right near your home. It's better to try to live with fire and instead of trying to control fire, because we can't control fire. If it doesn't burn like it's supposed to naturally, then it's going to be the devastating fires that take over homes, communities, and towns. The trees just start growing so thick, the dead underbrush just builds up, uh, creates lots of fuels for the fires. It burns so hot, so fast, um, burns in crown fires, which uh, are at the tops of trees and just burns so out of control that there's not much we can do to stop it. When you start, you know, building houses out in these areas, you know, that fire may have been suppressed for the last, you know, 100 years, 150 years, it's going to burn. It's not really a disaster, you know, like they were saying. It's, it's only a disaster you know, when you put people into the situation. So the fires are very necessary to keep the, keep the vegetation under control and keep the trees from being too close together and keeps the forest from being too thick. Keeps the fires from burning too hot when they do come through, because they're going to come through. Across the water, if fire were invented today, captured today, it would never make it past the regulatory agencies. It's much too dangerous. The side effects are horrendous, public health threats. It gives me, in a sense, some hope that all the other things that we've unleashed, from the atomic bomb to other kinds of horrors, we do have precedent for being able to cope and deal with large powers that we've assumed. And that example, perhaps a hopeful example, if a confused one, is fire. So really what we need to do is learn, to learn what the natural cycles of nature are and get out of their way when we have to and support them and to think and put that into our planning before. In one of the loveliest parts of Malibu, there's a hillside that's covered with all these houses. The last fire, I remember driving and there wasn't a house left standing, just hundreds of chimneys. I drove by the other day with my daughter and every single house is back there. And they haven't taken out the eucalyptus trees, in many cases, they've built with stucco and wood frame again. We have to learn from previous mistakes. We have to learn from nature. And we have to learn from each other how to help each other come through the disasters that life throws in your face all the time. What has been the cost of a century of fire suppression? The answer can be found right at the core of our current forest health crisis. A crisis that would likely not exist without fire exclusion. Because of wildfire suppression and because people have grown up with this idea that wildfire is inherently bad, the federal government comes in and puts out all forest fires, people have felt more comfortable moving into these wilderness wildland areas and surround themselves with big beautiful trees and they realize that well if a forest fire is beckoning on my back door, the, the federal government will probably come in and put that fire out for me. In the last two years, just on the North Fork here, we've spent 
little over nine and a half million dollars to protect just a couple lodges and about a half a dozen cabins. A lot of that is spent on structure protection, bringing in engines, bringing in crews to create defensible space around them. We've not done a good job in doing that prior to now. So we're having to take people that normally we'd have fighting the fire, dollars and resources. They're coming in when the fire's breathing down the neck of those cabins. We're in there cutting trees down to get better access around the lodges ahead of the fire. Wildfires being suppressed at the Wildland Urban Interface cost more to fight than wildfires being suppressed in any other situation. Since the early 70s, almost 30,000 homes destroyed by a wildland fire. That seems insignificant when you look at the United States and you think of how many homes that we have, but that's a lot of houses and structures uh, when you look at individual families and, and the costs associated with that. For local and state and federal governments, the price tag of that period of time has been close to $25 billion for suppressing those fires and the insurance industry on top of that in terms of the cost for rebuilding these homes has been in excess of $10 billion. It's not just the West, it's not just the East, it's Florida, it's New Jersey, it's New York, it's California. From 1965 to 1975, the price tag for fire suppression increased tenfold. Since the 1980s, large wildfires in dead and dying western forest have greatly accelerated the rate of forest mortality threatening people, property, and natural resources. Fuel loading is so high that future fire intensity could cause severe ecological damage. Living with fire in the urban interface is providing a, a significant problem for wildland firefighters. We put firefighters' lives at risk whenever we need to protect people's homes. Usually, we're putting firefighters in situations they normally would not be put in because we're trying to protect people's homes. I think we lost sight of what's really important. Uh, they would put uh, firefighters in, in jeopardy uh, of, of losing their lives for just a, just a simple wildland fire. It, it doesn't need to be this way. The public is at risk every time we have a fire in a wildland area, and we see that that's only going to escalate public has a role and a responsibility to understand where they live, to understand the dangers and the ramifications of how they're going to act when a fire is in their subdivision or within their city or within their community, and not a lot of people understand that. In October 1993, Laguna Beach, California burned, fueled by the sometimes infamous Santa Ana winds. An arsonist fire blazed across the hills that rise jagged from the Pacific. Complete neighborhoods were destroyed. The entire city was evacuated as fire swept across the hills toward Irvine. One firefighter referred to it as a runaway train. When all was said and done, and fire was no longer a part of the Laguna landscape, 232 families lost their homes. Historically, wildfires have occurred in forest and grasslands, but now they're happening in neighborhoods, and the risk only grows larger as the interface expands. But there is good news. Progress is being made. I think there's some encouraging signs that we're learning to live more compatibly with fire and understand the combustion process, particularly when it involves uh, structures and, and homes and the interface. Communities are beginning to understand more of that process and understand the mitigation measures that they can do to alleviate the fire or prevent the destruction of homes. Well, there's certainly a perception in the West that we can do whatever we want, we can live wherever we want, that we don't have to have limits on our own behavior. But we get people building in these fire-prone areas. Pretty soon we see increased demands for fire protection in fire suppression. But I think the returning frequency of large fires is showing us that we have to demonstrate self-restraint on our own actions. So for a lot of reasons, it doesn't make sense to allow continued or at least uncontrolled development in the wildland, private land interface. Proper planning and zoning in the wildland urban interface in areas like this is only necessary and unless we 
embrace the idea of restrictions on our own behavior, fire will teach us the lesson again and again that we're wrong. The great imbalance of fire within nature has reached epic proportions, putting communities and lives in constant danger. When does this imbalance become our collective responsibility? 99% of the public feel that fire is someone else's responsibility and they have no responsibility. Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, you have a responsibility. You built where you built your home and you have to take some of the responsibility for dealing with wildland fire. A lot of people feel that moving from cities to the wildland urban interface that they have the same type of fire protection that they had in the city, that they will be able to dial 911 and there'll be a fire truck roll into their yard and deal with a fire that's even in their structure or in the wildlands around the structure. And that's not the case in 90% of the areas around the United States. So there's this perceived impression that people have that they're covered uh, by a local fire department and, and they're not. Realistically, when you're dealing with uh, fire in a community, it really is everyone's responsibility. We just can't alone the state forest fire service with the local fire companies go out and say, hey, we're gonna address this wildfire problem, we're gonna take care of it. We do need the local residents. They need to buy in, they need to be aware, but they also have to be proactive to be a part of it. We have kind of lulled ourselves into a false sense of security, we sort of take it for granted that the fire department will be there. Well, the fire department can't always be there. You have to be responsible for yourself. I know personally, I lost my house in a brush fire, and I thought I did everything by the book. I honestly thought that my house was unburnable. Turns out I was very wrong. And the fire department at that time was so stretched out, so thin, they couldn't get to my house. So it was an incumbent upon me to protect my house. And as a result, I lost my house. No community is safe from wildfire. Plain and simple, fire happens. A case study is in order. Since 1986, wildland fire agencies, along with the National Fire Protection Association, have been aggressively promoting a very successful concept called FireWise, a program that acknowledges fire's essential role in the ecosystem. We recognized that there were problems and, and looked for some concept that would get the message across to the public and a very grassroots type of a concept that didn't seem like it was the federal government pushing a process into communities. FireWise is basically just a concept, an idea that homes can be built, designed, and maintained to withstand a wildland fire without the intervention of the fire department. A lot of work went into making it a process that anybody could use and everybody felt like they owned it. And I think that's one of the successes of the FireWise program right now is that you go around the country and everyone's using FireWise and everyone thinks it's their idea and it's their process and that's exactly what we want. If a community were FireWise, Prescribed burning would be a lot easier. That one element of worry and planning taken, taken out of the picture somewhat. They could begin to do more prescribed fires around communities that would be more strategic. The wildland urban interface is a complex landscape from both an environmental and political standpoint. For this patchwork quilt to work, partnerships must find the sometimes elusive balance between man and nature. That everybody needs to recognize you know, what the problem at hand is going to be and work together to, to ameliorate that or, or, or to mitigate that in somehow. And it has to come in with the landscaping and the materials used and that sort of thing. The most important thing that we've done with FIRE is really, one, educated landowners as well as agencies and really worked with the scientific community to understand FIRE and its role in the system. And I think the other thing that we've really done is tried to work collaboratively with private landowners to get a greater understanding of fire. One of the things is, is that we have to listen to each other better. So that those folks have to listen to the scientists and the economists and, and others. And we, we need to find uh, solutions that are more common than they are diverse. People are going to move into these natural areas, but that's not necessarily prohibitive. There are things we can do. We've got to do some big planning. 
For instance, if you look at the communities of the future, let's say we'll put a park here, we'll give grazing rights here, we'll do a control burn here. Therefore, if that predictable wildfire that our computer models tell us is going to come down, it comes down that hill. If it arrives at one of those areas where we've made these modifications, it will lay down to the point that we can stop it here. Therefore, here is a place to put that subdivision. We're on this landscape. Fire is part of this landscape. We have to learn to design those communities and live in those communities that are prone to fire in a much safer, sane way to do it. Creating defensible space is a major factor in the FireWise formula, and fuel modification is a major component. Thinning, removing, and cleaning the surface surrounding a structure allows fire to drop to the ground, where firefighters can effectively deal with the fight. As we've seen, fire needs fuel and oxygen to burn. By removing the fuel and creating defensible space, homes and lives stand a much better chance of survival. But the interface needs to be very sensitive to the fire concerns in that these roofs need to be made of non-flammable materials rather than shake and shingle roofs. Landscaping around these areas needs to be done in a way that's sensitive to fires. Just the, the cluster and clutter around the house needs to be needs to be kept back so that if in, indeed you know, structures need to be defended, they can, that can happen more readily and more successfully. We still have people moving out west, uh, building homes in forested areas, and not wanting to come in and build a vincible space around those homes. There's still a real lack of understanding as to what fire can do. One of the big issues would be just the maintenance of defensible space around their homes, where they realize if their home were to be threatened by a wildfire, that they can do something ahead of time proactively to protect their home, because there's no guarantee that a fire engine will be able to be at every house that's threatened by a fire. Yes, the fire department's there to help you, to help save your house, but really, you are the first line of defense against any fire. You've got to cut the brush back. You've got to, you've got to think ahead. You've got to think like a fire. You've got to know where the fire is going to attack you and address it. If you don't, well, you're going to lose your property and you could very easily lose your life. The simple truth is that wildland fires happen. The cycle continues because the cycle is nature. Traditional attitudes are sometimes tough to change. Many people maintain combustible homes in hazardous areas, thinking that fire won't happen to me. Some people will even rebuild two and three times after a fire without learning nature's harsh lesson, thinking that fire, like lightning, never strikes the same place twice. History teaches us this just isn't the case. I think the danger with the public understanding or misunderstanding are with fire fundamentalisms. That is, that fire has to be all good or it has to be all bad. That either fire is so intrinsically dangerous and hazardous that we can have nothing to do with it and we ought to exclude it from nature as we would try to exclude it from our house, or that fire is, is natural and therefore it is good and we ought to let fire uh, roam wherever it should. The reality is that fire synthesizes its surroundings. Uh, it behaves according to its surroundings. We have to think in, in terms of fire's context. We can't simply isolate fire and behave in a kind of absolutist way towards it. It's not enough just to beat up on suppression. It's not enough to say Smokey Bear was wrong because he was also right. We need, we need all of it. We need to find a larger story to embrace all those elements of fire. The cycle of fire is an unbroken phenomenon, a phenomenon that tracks as well as defines human history. It has been a story and will continue to be a story of finding balance, of where and how we live. Remember, Earth is a fire planet, and so it goes. All along the watchtower, princes kept the view. While all the women came and went, barefoot servants too. Outside in the distance, a wild cat did growl. Two riders were approaching.